Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, I have the great pleasure of introducing Professor Tim Menzies as our speaker today. Uh, Dr. Menzies is a professor in the Department of Computer Science at North Carolina State University. And I'll not go through his bio because it's too great for me to go through. So I'll just say uh, very quickly, among his many hours, he is an IEEE fellow. He has more than 200 referred publications and his research interests are in the software engineering with focus on software analytics software engineering for AI. And today he will talk, uh, he will discuss about the five rules of software engineering for AI. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Tim Mendes. A theme to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation. Sorry it took me so long to get here, but you know that nothing less than a pandemic would stop me coming to the Institute for Software Research. So it took a whole planet to get to delay me months to get here. I'm not going to talk about five laws today. I'm going to talk about one, because when I think about what's going on in the world right now, I think the comprehensibility is an, is an ethical requirement for uh, a lot of what we do in AI. And um, what I want to talk about is what it means to be ethical. Now, I won't talk about ethical specifics. I want to talk about what it means if I, if I, know, if I know optimization, if I know data mining, what can I say about ethics? If you look at what happens now, many people are publishing guidelines for ethics. On the screen right now, top left is some words from Microsoft, top right are some words from the European Union, and in the middle are some statements from the, from the IEEE. And I've spent some time trying to map between them, and what I've decided is no one knows what ethics means, because people use different terms, and if you go to any one of my blue ticks here, you're going to disagree with them. So I've decided that if I'm going to explore ethics, I'm going to explore at least the part of ethics that I can understand. So I want to have, uh, as a software engineer, I want to build AI systems that are accountable, transparent, inclusive, can integrate with human agency and allow human oversight. And if you take, go through those words and go through the chart at the top, you'll see that I'm addressing some of the concerns talked about by Microsoft, IEEE and European Union. Specifically, I want the thing shown at right. I want to have a human and an AI dancing together, building something. And as they build something, they, the, the success curve grows. And shown there in points one, two, three, four, five are the points where the human leans in and makes a decision. And shown there is the model size. Well, not shown on the scrap, it's the model size. So I want to say that I want to build better software. So there's some measure of success. On this graph, you're better if you're climbing the Z axis. But also it's hard to be ethical if X and Y are very large. If you, if to, if you, for you to understand what I've just done, if you have to look at 100 million different events where I made a decision or a model that's incredibly complicated to browse, it's very hard for you to reach in and disagree with me. What I'd love for you to be able to do is look at event two and say, I disagree with that decision. If we flip that decision, what happens to the rest of the design process? I want to say that when the data is low dimensional, the model size is very small, that we only need a few number of events to design something. And what I want to say to you is in software engineering, we have a unique opportunity to build systems that are very low on the X and Y axis shown on the screen, where the Z is the vertical Z dimension. There's something funky about SE data <clears throat> that makes it more comprehensible, more understandable, more auditable, and therefore more editable or ethical because it contributes to accountability, transparency, inclusiveness, integration with human agency, and allowing human oversight. Coughing, <coughs> beg pardon. So I really like this image of the the um, a large area array behind me, because I think my life is looking through the telescope. A lot of my colleagues want to do software engineering, and they want to support programmers matching brackets. And I think that's great. But once the brackets are matched, you use the software to do something. I want to know what happens when people use software. In my, world, in my software engineering career, when I was a software engineering research chair at NASA, we did requirements engineering, and we worked on spacecraft, model-based reasoning. We talked about um, mining software repositories and some of the work that got quite popular defect prediction and effort estimation first happened there at NASA. I went to the faculty track in 2006, did a lot of stuff with open science. I hope some of you know about the Promise and Rose initiatives. A lot of stuff with software product lines, scalable multiple objective optimization, a lot of stuff with software configuration, 
Uh, a lot of recent stuff was looking at software security issues, issue close time, project health reasoning over, you know, you know, it's no longer enough to do to write papers that talk about five, six projects. We talk about 1600 projects in our lab routinely to make decisions, um, culling false positives uh, using machine learning, test case minimization, prioritization, crowd-based uh, testing. These are things I've been involved with in, in the recent time. That's just a little snapshot of what I've done. Uh, so now I want to talk about um, uh, this talk. I want to make a case that the future of software engineering is heavily tied up with AI. I want to say that um, strangely, I don't work on deep learning because I'll show you some problems with deep learning that maybe want to go elsewhere. I want to talk about something called software 4.0, software 4.0, and something called GATE. And my, my statement to you is that when you teach someone analytics, software engineering, uh, about AI, you should start with GATE, G-A-T-E, and I'll show that to you. And I want to say that if you apply these principles to SE data, we get some astonishing simplifications that I think are important. Uh, you can't do anything without your grad students. I've been pleased to work with a bunch of very skilled people over time. And I just want to say that there's all these people who've contributed to the work in this, in this, in this paper. And frankly, I'm just the guy that gets the money and these people do the work. So all hail the grad students. Um, I also want to advertise a special issue of IEEE Computer, uh, AI Software and Engineering, Are We Ready? This is IEEE Computer. The due date is July 20, 2020. It's edited by myself, Tiff and Alexander. Uh, and the URL is there. If you want to just look at the URL, it's tiny.cc AISE21. Now, when we're talking URLs, please note bottom left of this slide, tiny.cc one lore down here. All the slides here are available at tiny.cc one lore. And um, uh, if you want the access the raw copy so you can do your steal it, use your own stuff with it, let me know. I'll give you access to the Google slides. So the two URLs here I want to make sure you know about are tiny.cc AIEC21, which is about the um, IEEE computer special issue on AI and software engineering. July 20, 2020. And I want to make sure you know about tiny.cc one law, which is the uh, slides here. So let's talk about the future of software engineering. And when I tell people that the future of software engineering is AI, some people complain and they say, no, 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 it's not the future, it's now, it is here. Now, what I think software engineers are about to become are midwives. And you recall what midwives do, they help people produce things. So what I think software engineering is going to become in the very near future is where the midwives helping other people find their truths. I think if you talk to astronomers about what happens when they do their work, astronomers don't just grind lenses. They don't just hold classes on how to grind a lens. They also put that lens into a telescope and they look through it to see the universe. Now, a lot of what we do in software engineering is grinding the lenses. I want to suggest to you that after we finish, grinding the lenses, we look through and we see things. What I want to say is that um, after we build the tools, we use them. And as we move into the era of the internet of things and the internet of things that matter, when IoT controls ambulances and heart and pacemakers and all that software driven, the world is software. We use software as our gloves to reason about the world. And AI is the tool that helps us look at all that data and make sense about it. So I want to say that there's a lot of uh, my future of my, my picture of software engineering is we're going to help people using the software to look at the world to make conclusions. I want to say that if you're um, uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, software engineering needs to know much more about AI. Some people disagree with me and say, no, 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 software engineering and AI are different disciplines. And I'll point out that for a long time, people have said certain things aren't software engineering. And then later on, we realized they were software engineering. So for example, um, uh, did you know once upon a time, users weren't allowed to be in software engineering that uh, there's a really famous quote from Dijkstra, Hixie 1979, where he said, you can't define users, so we can't reason about them. So once upon a time, software engineering wasn't about users. Once upon a time, software engineering wasn't about testing. If you look at Harlan Mills clean room idea, we take the compiler away from programmers Programmers write provably correct code that gets thrown over the wall to the testing team, but software engineers don't do testing. We don't believe that anymore. 
Once upon a time, software engineering wasn't about requirements. Even as late as the mid nineties, there were people that saying that software engineering starts once the requirements are written. And we just don't believe that anymore. We think software is the way to explore and refine requirements, hence the whole agile world. And once upon a time, we said software engineering wasn't about deployment. And now we find with continuous integration, there's so many useful feedback loops from continuous integration back to development that we really now think software engineering is about deployment, is about requirements, is about testing, is about users. And I think also it means it's about AI as well. Once upon a time, software engineering was not about AI. But if you look at all the keynotes at Exceed AI, all the ML papers we're seeing, all these papers, I, I'm just sorry. So there's an awful lot of software engineering and AI. Now, the other way around is I, what I will say is AI needs to know more about software engineering. Uh, I uh, hope my AI colleagues know that when they do a lot of AI, they're doing a lot of software. And if you're running with software, you need to install it, configure it, maintain it. You have to interface it. You have to do testing certification. You to support usability additions to make it usable. You got to package it. So AI needs software engineering. How many of you have read Scully's 2015 paper, Technical Debt at Google with their AI systems? And what, what, what Scully says is, you know, the brain might be four pounds, but the body could be hundreds of pounds. And so if you look at the little black dot in the middle of this, that's lines of code of Google AI software in 2015, surrounded by things that so much are standard software engineering. So AI needs software engineering. And I wrote that up as five laws of SE, and that's IEEE software last year. I invite you to read that and have fun. So um, uh, every time I do a talk about AI, people want to know what I think about deep learning. And uh, well, let me tell you what I think about deep learning. Uh, um, uh, so uh, if we look at uh, people doing deep learning and software engineering, uh, we, here are different areas in software engineering where we're seeing deep learning papers. Uh, these columns are different kinds of deep learners. Um, uh, 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 RNNs, uh, uh, convolutional embedding, feed forward, uh, D2, D here is someone's roll their own deep learner method, and et cetera, et cetera. Now, so we can, so in top ranked papers with more than 10 citations per year, we can find uh, about 94 papers on deep learning. And if we ask how many of those papers compare what they do to non-deep learning methods, sadly, about half of them don't even bother to a comparison to non-DL, which I think is methodologically bad. Uh, also less than, definitely less than half, don't compare themselves to doing hyper parameter optimization, which is the trick of asking a second learner to learn the parameters of this learner. Now hyper parameter optimization is really important because so many people, including myself, have shown that the learners when they come off the shelf are just a bad idea. How many of you have done configuration research? You know, trying to tweak the parameters of a, of, a, of an SQL make file so that the delivered database has certain energy requirements and certain, certain throughputs. Well, that's the configuration problem. And AI tools have a configuration problem as well. And hyperparameter optimization is ways, to, is ways to handle that. And when people compare you know, DL and non-DL, I really think they should be comparing with hyperparameter optimization because otherwise it's just a stupid comparison. Now, there's only a very small number of papers that do the compare to non-DL and also do hyperparameter optimization. So these are the heroes of software engineering and deep learning. And these papers should be read. Uh, but um, it's not like it's swept the field and taken over all areas. It's still an experimental area. It's not like the solution to everything. And uh, also when we do experiments with deep learning, um, these are various data sets that many of you know. These are sort of standard software engineering data sets. So things like CAMEL is defect prediction and PITS here is um, someone's writing a, uh, um, uh, an error message in a repository. And we don't know whether the error message reflects a low severity or high severity bug. And so the PITS problem is, just, is putting severity labels on commits. And there's all these different standard software engineering problems. And measured in terms of recall, when we take our best state-of-the-art non-DL method and the best DL we know, we get these curves here. And you notice that DL, the red curve, is doing better than the blue curves usually. If we apply our stats, this is what the um, uh, 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 bootstrap and, and uh, 
uh, Cliff's Delta effect size test tells us that here's the region where DL is doing better. So DL is better, right? But have a look at the false alarms. One of the reasons you can get higher recalls is you make more mistakes with false alarms. So here you see DL, the red has only got lower false alarms, a very small region. When we put the two of them together, this is the area under the curve of, P of recall false alarm. This is the region where DL does better than anything else. And over here, you see regions where you would want to use DL because it's doing better than non-DL. And over here are regions where the improvement of the non-DL over the DL is about the same. So the case for DL sweeping the field and replacing everything else in software engineering analytics has yet to be made. Now, if you ask me to do machine learning on a high dimensional data space, like if you tell me we're reasoning from 10,000 wavelets coming out of some um, uh, um, uh, signal processing system, of course I would reach for deep learning because I want the first couple of layers to do the automatic feature engineering so I can reason over 10,000 wavelets. Yes, that's when I'd use DL. But what I want to get to at the end of this paper, end of this talk is, is software engineering inherently high dimensional? And if it isn't inherently dimensional, I don't want to recommend DL. And we'll get to that at the end of this talk. I also want to say there's another reason I want to do a different kind of AI to what is being standard right now. Who's read The Social Dilemma? Who's, who's seen it? Who's seen the movie, The Post Social? Okay. And, and I, you know, these are the people doing the engagement systems for Facebook and Instagram and and, and Twitter. And these people on camera will tell you that they're very worried that the systems they produce have socially undesirable effects, polarization, isolation of people. And they're on the screen with the camera in front of them, they'll say, we don't know how these systems work. The people who built these systems will on camera tell you that there's problems with these systems and we don't know how they work. And so I want to talk about another kind of AI where we do know how they work and we can fix problems we don't like. And that I think is ethical. Comprehensibility is a precondition for ethical software engineering and AI. So I, my, my uh, preferred system, and I don't know how to do this with DL, is where I can generate this graph and say, we, we got to where we wanna go after a small number of human events. The model's small enough to view, you can now audit what we did and you can reach in and replay and make change decisions. I don't know how to do this, in a DL framework. I do know how to do it in another framework. The other framework that I'm now gonna present is what I wanna call software 4.0, software 4.0. And the thing I wanna show you here is um, a high level picture of what AI does. And that high level picture will be called GATE. And what I wanna to suggest to you is when you teach a novice, anything to do with AI, software analytics, everything, don't start with um, naive based classifiers. Don't start with decision trees or DL. Start with GATE. When you teach people AI, start with GATE. And we'll get to there in just a second. So there's a thing called software 2.0 where large amounts, where some parts of the development process is automated. And uh, I wanna take that and I wanna add to it algorithms that understand people and people that understand the algorithms. And I'm saying that combination of automation plus algorithms and people that understand each other, I want to call that software 4.0. And if uh, just to remind you, software 1.0 is traditional manual methods and 2.0 is there's some automation for some task. And the standard picture in software 2.0 is there's two teams. Team two does the normal non-AI things. Team one are the uh, nerd herders for the optimizer. And they carefully curate the examples the optimizer uses to train. And that the optimizer tells you how to do your test cases in a better order or how to redesign your screen to reduce energy or something like that. And what I wanna say is uh, I've done so much team one stuff that there are reusable patterns that can be supported by AI. Team one doesn't need to manually massage their examples. And, what, and the activities team one do is actually science, is actually software engineering, is actually AI. And I think in these words here, manually massage, we can load in a whole bunch of tools and supports, assistance for them. And then we're good talk, getting to the point now where if you do all that, you'll have tools that don't just help people develop software, but anybody 
sitting down with an AI. So we're talking about tools that help a human and an AI sit down together and solve a task together. Just a sound check, uh, how's my volume and stuff? Raise your hand if you can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, cool, just checking. Now I gotta say, I was doing this talk the other day and um, the guy decides to mow the lawn outside the window. And you know, you know, nothing for two weeks. I sit down to do a teleconference and suddenly outside the window, the guy does a lawn mower. And if that wasn't enough, then he came back with a leaf blower just outside the window. Nothing for two weeks. I sit down to do a teleconference, he shows up straight away. I don't know where he is now, but I expect him to show up soon. Tim's law of Zoom. No sound until you start Zooming, then there's a, okay, sorry, carry on. Now, why do I think that humans have to have a lot of feedback loop inside an AI system? I think anyone who's really done commercial software analytics knows that it's so much more than just giving data to a learner and you get an answer. If you look at what the Microsoft people told us at ICSI 2019 SEIP, they offered this whole rich picture of how people do things. And my experience has been that when I do this cycle, I find research questions, task and automation that help me with these feedback loops all the way through. And some of these feedback loops go right the way back to changing the requirements. So in my experience, when AI and human beings get together, there's interaction where results from the AI mean that the human changes and refines the task. So what I'm seeing here is like a picture of agile software on steroids, where the iterations are driven by insights from the AI, but humans are in the loop. So if the goal of software engineering 2.0 is to get people out of the loop, well, that's, that's, that's a trite characterization, okay? That's actually the wrong thing to say, but it's not like AI is gonna replace people in software engineering. There's so many human level loops that have to be supported. Well, let's support them. Um, uh, let's say that you're doing a hard task, you have a lot to read, you're looking for, you're, you're, you're inspecting a large code base looking for uh, uh, bad coding, these security bugs. And that's a pretty long task inspecting everything. What about if instead an AI sits over your shoulder and watches you do things and you say, not a bug, not a bug, that's a bug, not a bug, not a bug, that's a bug. And the AI is learning a model of you. And after a while, the AI taps you on the shoulder and says, you know, you could go away now, right? You know, you could go and do something else. I've learned what you mean by a buggy software module. I will go and label the rest and do the rest of the reasoning. And so you go away and the AI does the rest. This is of course the standard active learning loop. There's unlabeled examples. There's some strategies, some oracles, some labeling things. And many of you know about active learning. And I can characterize this by this graph I've been showing you where there's a number of events where people make decisions and some success has been raised. And we have found this is a useful loop for doing things like, um, you know, you, you go to Google Scholar and type defect prediction and get 10,000 papers. And you wanna go forth and read the 50 that you care about. And we've done this for that. And we've done this for, you know, security violations and technical debt and labeling defective modules. And what we find is nearly the same under the hood active learner works for all these examples. So this cycle is a general thing that holds across many, um, many software engineering applications. Now let's talk about this thing called GATE. And what I'm going to show you is something that subsumes a whole bunch of stuff. And the, and the underlying thing here is that the human and the AI are holding hands and walking together and going through the world. And supposing you, there's, we've already looked around a bit and we've find, found five things that we don't like, we'll call them bad. And five things that we do like, we'll call them good. And let's say we've done a tiny bit of modeling and here's a model for recognizing alphaness and here's a model for recognizing betaness. And if, you're, if you score high on the beta, that means you're probably part of this bad scale. And if you score high on the alpha, you're probably part of this good scale. And this could be a simple Euclidean distance, or it could be a naive base classifier, computing likelihood, or any other number of methods. But you know, from a very small number of examples, we have a partial understanding of what we mean by bad and what we mean by good. Now, there's a standard technique in, in, in AI called generate and test, uh, G for generate, T for tie to try or test. In software engineering, a repeated experience is that generate is orders of magnitude faster than test. If you give me a product line expressed as a bunch of um, theorems, 
and you just say, hello, Z3, give me a whole bunch of designs that satisfy these products. You can get millions of designs a minute. You can generate millions of ideas a minute. If we go to everyone on this in this panel, in this meeting right now, and we took from them the range of shirt colors and glasses, yes, no, and beards, yes, no, with the sample of people in this room, we could generate billions of variants of people in a, in a minute, wouldn't be very fast at all. But testing them can be very slow. Supposing you have to go to a human and say, is this a good car? Do you like it? Suppose you have to recompile MySQL, run all the test case, that's very slow. Some theorem proving tasks are very, very slow. So in between generate, which is very fast, and test, which is very slow, we, went, we add A, which is assess. Now, given that you've got the generation things, you will ask, how are you alpha-ness or beta-ness? How alpha or beta are you? And so the thing I'm calling active learning, where you find the most interesting example and evaluate that next, that's when alpha equals beta. So that's the region in here. Optimization would be find examples that maximize alpha and minimize beta. So that's alpha divided by beta. Taboo search, let's say you're doing some you want to cover all the state space of the system. You want to go to some place you haven't been to before. Taboo search is minimize alpha plus beta. And that would drive you to examples here, here, and here. And, and planning is take what you have now, add in all the alpha things, minus everything in beta. And whatever's left is the thing that drives you away from beta and towards alpha. And, uh, 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 and there was something else to say there. So the idea is that Billions of options may be here. They get assessed very fast and you have one more option that gets evaluated by these slow methods. Then there's one more dot here on the screen. So now you need something called expand, which is say you wanna update the models used in GNA and around you go again. So this is my model of humans and AI talking together. And if you ask me, you know, have I just blurred together um, configuration, active learning, fuzzing, classification, optimization, explanation, planning, sensitivity analysis. I'll say, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think this is a meta framework where you can introduce one set of ideas and then go down and do literature reviews and say how these ideas have been you know, expressed in different frameworks. And if someone says, well, are you talking about cross entropy or taboo search or parts in Rosenblatt windows or Bayesian framework? I'll say, yeah, all of these. I'm an engineer. I know that there are theoretically important distinctions between Bayesian parameter optimization and Parsian Rosenblatt windows uh, as, as used in hyperopt. These are important distinctions, but if I wanna teach people AI, I start at gate and come down. And using this framework on this slide, let me show you the last 10 PhDs out of my lab. This is years of work. TAR3, STAR, XMO, Ball, LACE, Witch, Gale, Dodge, Flash, Emblem, Snap. They're all gate. They're all gate. So this is what I think we should teach people to give them a deep understanding of what AI is, and then they can go down and, and understand how it gets employed down here. This is my picture of AI that I offer you, of humans and AI walking together, having fun in the world. And um, uh, here's a very simple example of using gate. Uh, if you just ask a standard learner, find me the most, the fewest number of modules with the most number of errors, so when I fix things, I'm doing the least and fixing the most. If, you, so if you're assessing a, um, uh, a learner by how least you have to look at to find how many bugs, certain standard learners, uh, C4.5 or J4.8, depending on, who, on which implementation you're using, do very badly on this curve. Using gate very simply, we implemented the green curve, which achieved you know, really high recall divided by lines of code. And so from this example, I would say that um, uh, we should stop using off the shelf tools and we can customize them using gate. So here's an off the shelf tool and here's gate. Uh, it's not, how is gate different from active learning? It is active learning. It is one, active learning is part of it. When I generalize active learning to optimization, other things, I, I get gate. Um, and what I, what I can do with gate is with a very simple number of base structures, give people a 14 week graduate class, introducing them to data mining, optimization, a whole bunch of tasks. Gate is my secret for teaching AI succinctly so that people know how to refactor AI tools. Another much more complicated example of gate is with optimization. 
So we know that with hyperparameter optimization, we can go to learners that aren't looking very well. And for say defect prediction after optimization, we can find that they're doing crazy well. Uh, the problem is we have to search a hyperparameter optimization space. So these are all the options that people will make via they they that using engineering judgment, which is euphemism for just 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 guess. People decide the parameters of the learners, and then they improve this to that. And that can take an awful long time because there's an awful lot of these spaces. Now, recently we've come up with a way to do the same hyperparameter optimization of software engineering with an algorithm called Dodge. And Dodge does not explore 10 to the nine inputs. It explores literally 30 inputs. And Dodge says, if the out input space to the optimizer is all these different choices, the output space is actually very small. If we're assessing a learner by recall and false alarm, and if we take the, whatever data we're using and whatever learner we're using, and we divide the data up into 10, 90% chunks at random, we run the learner, we don't get one recall and false alarm, we get 10 recalls and false alarm. And if you do the statistics, there's a certain point where the numbers are so close together, you can't distinguish them. Call that epsilon. The principle of epsilon domination is if you can't, once you can't distinguish between two things, stop optimizing for anything finer than epsilon. Now for many uh, SE applications, epsilon's about 0.2, which means the output space divides up into 100 possible outputs across recall false alarm. So what Dodge does, it's a taboo search across the output space. We pick options for the optimizer at random. We configure the learner, we run the learner, we get a score a recall false alarm. So take a dart, throw it at the thing over here, and the dart lands on one of the squares. Now go back and pick something else at random, configure the learner, run it, throw the dart. If the new dart ends up on the same square as the old dart, then go back to those options and say, boring, stay away from those. So using feedback from the output space, we go back and start wiping out similar things in the, in the input space. It's a taboo search across the output space. And after 30 picks, we find we do crazy well. Now I'm gonna come back to this example at the end of this talk. I'm gonna point out to you that this is a pretty damn stupid optimizer. And this damn stupid optimizer shouldn't work if software engineering data is really complicated. The rig I've just shown you, 30 times, we're gonna do an informed choice around say 10 to the nine options. If that works, that means most of those 10 to the nine options have the same effect. That means the internal state space has got lots of regularities and similarities. So I'm gonna come back at the end of this talk and show you that this works for a really interesting reason. But before we go on, just make sure you understand this clearly won't work if the problem is very complicated. If I really have to explore thousands to millions of options to find nuanced distinctions, this won't work. Okay, now let's talk about uh, auditability. In a, in a gate framework, G-A-T-E, I can now say, how, what's your effort to understand what I've just done? And here's my chart over here. Here are the events where I make decisions. Here's some success criteria. Uh, now this axis here is how many times I go around the gate loop. Here's the model size. I can tell you that for many software applications, these two dimensions, these alphas and betas, are, are suspiciously small. So if I uh, do literature reviews, or if I'm reading software code, looking for security vulnerabilities, or if I'm exploring technical debt, it looks like I have to explore an awful lot of you know, 10,000 papers, or read 30,000 methods in a, in a piece of code, or read 6,000 commits looking for technical debt. If I do this game up here and I increment my support vector machines along the way, I can characterize the size of the model by how many support vectors I need. And I can characterize the number of effort here by how many times we stop and make a decision. So look at the size of the space we're exploring, 30,000 methods looking for security flaws. And only about 300 times do we pause and make a decision about whether something's vulnerable. And only, and that builds a support vector machine model with only 150 examples. And this occurs a lot. Seemingly large software engineering problems can be tamed with a very small amount of human interaction and a very small internal model. And I wanna get back to that. I think that's an important principle which we should be exploiting. 
Seemingly complex problems can be tamed with a small amount of human interaction and a very small internal model. I want to get back to this point. I think there's something weird about soft SE data that means we can radically simplify the whole process of software 4.0. What I'm about to show you doesn't hold for outside software engineering. What I'm about to show you suggests there's a way to build very simple, comprehensible systems inside software engineering because of a fundamental property of software engineering data. I submit to you software engineering data is fundamentally simple. And many other people agree. Prem Devenbu, Abram Hindle, their naturalness paper, they point out that while people could in principle write arbitrarily complicated code, in practice, they write very regular code with repeatable properties. The whole fact that software analytics works means that very simple statistical models let us make predictions about, about software engineering. Why is that so? Well, it's because our languages conform to something called Ziff's law. Just think about the word language. When we define computer science, we got lucky. We picked up a technology called language that the apes have been using for millennia so they could communicate with each other, succinctly do error correction. We used language. Language has a property called Ziff's law. If you go through all these different languages, count how often people say things. A small number of words are used a lot and a large number of words are used very rarely. You can see a log log frequency here. Without the log log, you'll see a massive spike up here and a very large flat plateau over here. So we know that when humans talk, they do a small number of things a lot and a very large number of things very rarely. And over here is in, uh, in uh, Java code, exactly the same as this law distribution, which means our software engineering data has massive repeated structures because that's the nature of language. Now, I'm not the only, now I think I can exploit that to simplify many things. I'm not the only one. If you look at Mu Yun Kim and her students doing big tests and big fuzz, if you look at their, them testing scripts, processing very large big data applications, I mean, they're talking about scripts that are running over gigabytes, terabytes of data. And you'd think testing those would be crazy hard. All the combinations of all the possible data they might see in their big cloud environment. But when they looked at their scripts, they found the number of pathways through the scripts were crazy small. So they had all these applications for doing, for doing um, uh, different applications where you know, the uh, movie rating system only had like five pathways to the whole system. So you only needed five tests to test the system for a system that was processing you know, 50,000 examples. Here's something with 4 billion examples that possibly tested by six scripts. I think there's repeated structure in software engineering, which simplifies the internal search space, which makes uh, auditability easier. Other people think so too. So I uh, don't know why this slide's here. Uh, I'm going to say that I'm more, I'm, I'm, I'm ethical if you can critique me. You can critique me if the number of events required to make a decision is very small and if the generated model is very small. Let's see if that's true. Let's, I'm going to now show you mathematically that software engineering is astonishingly simple. It's data. Here we have some standard analytics data sets, defect prediction, issue tracking data sets, data sets about when is GitHub issues going to close, bad smell detection. Call that the software engineering data. Here's the non-software engineering data, uh, UCI repository. Uh, who knows the role of the UCI repository in the history of AI? Anybody? Okay, so you know that a lot of AI algorithms were developed using data from the UCI repository. Okay, well, I'm going to tell you something very strange about the UCI data. To do it, we have to talk about intrinsic dimensionality. And to do that, I have to introduce you to Tim and Tom. Tim lives on a street or a street that runs north south. If Tim wants to find a friend, if Tim walks north south, he might find somebody. If he walks east west, there's nobody. And if he walks up down, there's nobody. So even though Tim looks like he lives in a three dimensional space, he's actually living in a one, effectively one dimensional space. Tom lives downtown. Tom lives in a block of flats. If Tom walks north-south, he might find some people. If he walks east-west, he shouldn't do that. Do you know why? Why shouldn't Tom walk east-west on it in this block of flats? 
because he walks off the balcony and falls down. Come on, people, yeah. stay with me. <laughs> if Tom walks up and down, he might find some other people. So what we say at the intrinsic dimensionality is go for a walk and see how many people you find. So as I walk some distance, how many more examples do I find? Take the log log scale of that, and that's the, uh, the max gradient of that is the intrinsic dimensionality of the space. Software engineering, non-software engineering data, what does any, what do you see? What's the intrinsic dimensionality of the SE data versus the UCI data? Anybody? Anybody? This is an important point. The SE data is three times simpler on average than the software. The, so the, the algorithms we use to build most of our AI stuff was built on stuff more complicated than what's seen in software engineering. And it's quite interesting that the number of dimensions is, is uh, there at two, two, three at most, right? So yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, probably you could represent as an image the software, right? Always. Oh, sure. But yeah, yeah. And, and, and if you don't want to use this, just use PCA. A lot of domains to come to PCA of three, right? Okay. Now, remember that um, algorithm I spoke of before, that really dumb optimizer called Dodge that did the taboo search on the output space? And remember I said that it probably wasn't going to work very well if the problem was complicated. Okay, well, what we have here is, here's the data we just spoke of. Here is all the data sorted by the intrinsic dimensionality. And here, we're gonna do experiments. We're gonna do dodge versus the best non, the best uh, non-dodge thing we could find, the more complicated system. And we're doing things like defect prediction, issue tracking, issue close time, predicting bad smells, or we're doing classification of various UCI tasks. And recall that the SE data, its mean intrinsic dimensionality was about three and the non-SE data was about four. And this purple line says that below an intrinsic dimensionality of about 3.5, 80% of the time, my dumb optimizer called Dodge works better than anything else. And as the dimensionality gets more and more complicated, my dumb optimizer stops working so well. So what I want to say to you is match the complexity of the problem of the analysis of the complexity of the data. And a lot of the SE data is crazy simple. And the analysis of SE data could therefore be crazy simple. If you really need 10,000 wavelets for your system, you're way up here on this scale. Don't use what I'm talking about. But a lot of SE data is way at the simple end. So what have we learned? I want to do ethics. I want people to understand my system. I submit to you that for my system to have accountability, transparency, inclusiveness, to integrate with human agency, to allow human insight, people have to be able to read my systems. Specifically, if I make decisions as I build something, I want them to be able to revisit those decisions. The number of decisions has to be small. The model built has to be small. And so I'm, uh, so I'm saying that um, it's very hard to be ethical if you're using crazy complicated systems. And I'm saying that there's something we've got in software engineering that other domains don't have. I can show it to you precisely mathematically. Uh, so uh, uh, when data is low dimensional, it's very easy to be better and ethical. And that's my talk. Uh, there's a loophole in software engineering that has not been exploited enough before. We should do it. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you, Tim, for the awesome talk. So I would request the audience to, if possible, unmute and please clap because that is something that we don't hear in Zoom settings. So if possible, please. That was pathetic. Let's try it again <laughs> on the count of three. I want to hear. Uh, uh, okay, so you guys are playing Stanford and you're just about to make a, to uh, uh, a touchdown goal. Okay. Three, yeah. two, one. Go. That's better. Thank you so much. <laughs> so, uh, for the audience, you can post your questions in the chat. I can read them out loud, or you can unmute yourself and ask questions. Uh, so, right now, I will read uh, the questions that is already there. So, how is Gate different from an active learning loop with the human and the oracle position? Uh, well, it, 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 it is an active learner. It's just that when I look at active learning and Bayesian parameter optimization and hyper opt and a whole bunch of things, if I want to explain this to somebody, to a grad student, if I want to come up with a minimum uh, uh, library 
to code up all these different things as special cases, I find the gate framework to be, to be, to be, to be, to be very powerful. So it's just an engineering, it's just an engineering framework for reasoning about hundreds of things. And I've, and it's just been the way we've generated literally dozens of PhDs at my lab. So uh, is, it, is, it, is this law and combinations of tokens? So the question there, uh, can I generalize that to really what's the best way to, um, to do dimensionality analysis? Like how can we really understand our space? Now that's actually a very interesting question because I don't know how to do it too well. Currently when I do my intrinsic dimensionality calculations, if the underlying dimensionality gets more than 20, my current calculator rolls over and dies, doesn't work very well. It works great below 15. So I'm really happy to say that software engineering is three. What I don't know how to do at this time, and maybe you can help me, is compute the intrinsic dimensionality of complex recursive structures source code, literally. I don't know the intrinsic dimension of source code. I suspect it might be a measure of the Markov chain size required to do it, but I, don't, I, haven't, I haven't checked that yet. So I think that's a very insightful question. Um, how do you know the data is gen representative generalizers? Um, how do I generalizers? Well, uh, uh, well, firstly, it just keeps working. Like my first thing when I ever find a domain, I ask, how have other people done it? What's the way to simplify that by a factor of 10? Let's try that. Oh, it works. That's just, that's just work to 20. Okay. Secondly, I don't have to claim my works generalizable. If I have an intrinsic dimensionality calculator, I can offer you a methodology. I can say, compute the dimensionality of your space and then match the complexity of the analysis to the complexity of the space. I will say that I think many of you already agree with me. Who knows the principle of locality in operating systems? Any hands, principle of locality? The principle of locality says that uh, most of the time of an operating system is in a small number of spaces that you know, in the old days when we had hard drives that spun and disks, operating systems do not always jump all over the hard drive that where they ask for data now is about where they're gonna ask for it next. So the fact that we have got operating systems that used to swap out of virtual memory, uh, you know, things you are using right now swap out. We've used the idea that the space we're exploring is very simple to great effect in operating system research for decades. So in some sense, I'm reporting something that we've had hints for, for decades. Should we stop writing papers about AI learning systems and software engineering corollary? No, no, um, we haven't cracked. Um, um, should we stop? Um, uh, as soon as you take this, this game on, the very first thing you hit is multi-objective optimization. You have to ask the local people, what do you think is important? And I'm going to tell you, it's not going to be recall or precision. It's going to be, we want to build this system using the most number of modules that we've used before. Or we want to build this system so that it's got the most number of functionality that's not available elsewhere. That if you really, the funny thing about exploring my kind of algorithms is very quickly, you get into exploring user preference space. And it's um, still a black art. When I sit down with users to say, what are your preferences, the things we want to optimize for? It is still months of work. And I still have to show them some prototype and say, oh yeah, I didn't, I didn't tell you this one thing. So, so I would say the thing we need to study a lot of is how this stuff interacts with humans and how human cognitive processing interacts with discovery. My tool for doing that is to build this kind of interactive AI tool and then see what happens when humans get to it. Um, can we distinguish data remains interesting and offer challenges? Well, firstly, on the screen right now, I have my intrinsic dimensionality calculator. And so in some sense, you could say we should drop all research unless it's high on the x-axis. And I think that's, un, that's unkind. I, I think we should acknowledge the world we're living in 
is often low dimensional. Otherwise, dummies like us wouldn't have been able to build science, engineering, the world around us. Evolution probably wouldn't work if, if, if our genome was inherently high dimensional. I find it hard we've evolved to this point unless there's some low dimensional approximation to our genome. Uh, and I, I think it's fascinating asking how can we exploit that? So um, um, also I'll tell you something else, Andre, there's nothing harder than simplicity research. For me to publish a paper to say, this is a very simple way of doing something. I have to baseline it against the most complicated state of the art. So my students are always melting down CPUs so we can certify simpler systems, which I find very interesting. Also, Andre, you're being a smart ass, so just, just, just pull your finger out and, and, and let people do their stuff. Other questions? I have a question. So great talk, Tim. Thank you for thank you for the talk. I um my I my favorite um part is your um your metaphors like your um the the four pound brain with the hundred you know hundreds of pounds of body or whatever and the uh, the midwife um analogy, um, but like. So if we think about it, like the software engineers as midwives for truth and that kind of a, a thing, um, and this brain metaphor, are, are, are we talking about replacing the, the engineering of just that brain, but the, the surrounding body that surrounds it is still being implemented by humans using traditional source code, you know, IDEs and all that kind of thing? Or wow. are we talking about replacing the body in, in software engineers are, are now are, are training models to do that part as well. Um, sorry for the flash, flash, flash. Okay. Okay. I deny the premise of the question. <laughs> okay. I don't think there should be a separation. I think uh, if, if you, if you look at some, um, um, um uh, so, so my wife's an English professor. She talks about maker spaces, where people learn things by exploring the affordances of the tools around them. So instead of some sort of, you know, rational Baconian description of science, you know, in, in her world, people bumble around. And then there's a new tool with new affordances, like the Large Hadron Collider, and that lets you learn more things. And so, and so, the idea of separating brain from body seems a rather wrong thing to do. On the screen right now are the feedback loops, some of the feedback loops that I found useful. And I would say that in an agile AI project, we take feedback from whatever source we have to improve all parts of the system, AI and SE. So I, I wouldn't separate the world as, as you suggest. I'd say it's it all goes into the blender and away we go. So are AI systems being used to implement? So, I mean, uh, first of all, I, I didn't suggest the brain body analogy you did. I'm just repeating the, from your slides, the, the example you <laughs> used. But, um, but, but okay, so, so what has traditionally been body and not brain? Like, you know, the, the, you, know the, you have the, the AI engine that Google uses and surrounding it is, is a bunch of handwritten code by humans. Um, but, but, our, but, but okay, so go, going forward, I'm, I'm, I'm with you now. The, the, you know, let's, let's, let's start, the, the, let's not make that arbitrary distinction. Let's, let's think of them all, all the same. But then are we thinking about a future where um, we're guiding uh, an automatically written program to do all of it. We guide no um, to do all, no no well oh, well oh, well um, I think if the data source settles down, if you're talking about a static domain with no change, then after a while you could automate humans out of the loop. Okay. Okay. But if you're talking about the real world where stuff changes all the time, you're always assessing your thing like um. Like I could have done this whole talk another way. I could have said incremental V and V of AI. Yeah, okay. I will say the world changes. Gotcha. You can't stop. It's wrong to stop. Um, I'm trying to see the point of your, not the point no, of your question, but I'm trying I'm to sorry. see, I'm, I'm trying, trying to see the point of disagreement because in some sense, I think you're, we're in wild agreement that yeah. the stuff has to be incrementally improved 
with feedback from all sources. Well, and, and, and it seems to me like I'm, I'm starting to converge with you with the, the framing. I think that the, the, the programmers, we might still need programmers to write a new compiler for a new language or something like that. But then the the system, the, the, the brain, what I don't know, whatever, can learn from the programmer, him or herself. It, it's another input to the system. Well, 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 but but I, you know, I feel like somewhere in your thinking is the point where the human steps back and goes to sleep. Now, um, that sort of happens in my world, but they're going to get a lot of nudges sometimes from the AI saying, hey, um, I need your opinion on something. Right. You know, so, so um, uh, maybe the AI goes to the coffee shop in the bottom of the hotel and has uh, the human goes to the coffee shop in the bottom of the hotel. And sometimes the waiter comes up and says, excuse me, uh, uh, Jim, uh, Dr. Jones, we need your opinion on blah, blah. And here's a set of options. You, what do you gotcha, think? Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. But I wouldn't divorce humans and AI. I think I think there's much more to be gained to putting them together. Right. Right. Uh, Joshua wants to ask a question over audio. Hey Tim. Uh, so great talk. Thank you very much for it. Um. So, so Jim kind of touched upon my question when he talked about, for example, automatically written code. So I'm looking at the examples that uh, you've listed so far. Um, and I'm also thinking about the, the kind of, I guess, um, underlying premise that SE data is much simpler than the non-SE data, like the ones from the UCI repository. And I'm trying to think about the limits of that and what comes to mind, um, which not quite automatically written programs, but for instance, for, for instance, automatic program repair. And I'd like to hear more about your thoughts. Wow. Whether, okay. Yeah. Whether well, what's 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 been what's been the experience of program repair people? Uh, did they do they have to up their CPUs for doing repair on auto generated code? Well, like I, I'm thinking, for example, like so there's there's this uh, line of, for example, ML research that's really going into, for instance, program synthesis nowadays. And thank you. I, I, I'm sorry, I missed I missed the middle. Say that sentence again, please. So I, I'm thinking like like complexity up to degree, for example, where ML systems are even like synthesizing, for example, uh, like quick sort algorithms based on some kind of uh, uh, specification, for instance. And yeah. so I'm wondering like what you think the limits are of this, that there's, I imagine there are SE data that are as complex as uh, these non SE data from like UCI repository. We just haven't looked at it much yet, and I'm wondering your thoughts about that. Oh uh, well, 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 I'm I'm with oh, well. Firstly, I'm with uh, Prem Devenbu and um, Abram Hindle that in principle we could build complicated stuff that destroys us. In practice, we don't seem to be doing that. Like you know, you know, did you read uh, uh, May's paper? Go to not not harmful. Like, you know, in, in principle, go to is a bad thing. But if you look at millions of lines of code and millions of examples we're using go to, they just don't do it the bad way. Um, um, uh, Prem really does find that with a small number of tokens, he can predict the next token on most, most code. Now, there are more complicated problems. But what I want to ask the SE community is why do we assume complexity as our first stop why don't we first test for simplicity and then build a test for distinguishing simple from complicated and then build a suite of tools mm -hmm. what i fear right now is that because of you know we're trying to out, out, outdo each other that we have a disease which is complexity itis we we why do we first assume complexity? Mm. Now, but, but come back to my question. Do you know whether the program repair people have to up their CPU when they're doing repair on automatic on auto generated code? Because that would be that would be a, an example of that would be consistent with your thesis. So I, I, I think I'm not even sure if there's much work on and if someone in the room is, is more familiar with it than I am. I don't even think there's much work that 
looks at that beyond the fact that there are, for example, program repairs or program edits that um, easily go beyond, for instance, 100 lines of code. And they're, they're not necessarily just like refactorings, for example. They're, they're really, I'm, I'm really making um, substantial semantic edits to the code. I agree with you that that would be a fruitful source of empirical investigation to double check my thesis. But even if, but, but I'm going to make a prediction here, what we'd find is a long tail distribution, that there will be some disastrously complicated things. Okay. But, you know, why do we jump to the complex? Why don't we say there's a spectrum of simple to complex? Here's a measure for dividing them. And we talk about engineering methods. I mean, wait, you, I, okay, I, I, think, I think I've made my point. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a, that's a good point. I think having that methodology for making that distinction so that we can apply the the machine learning. And, but 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 no one said ethics yet. Like like my framing of this is I want systems that are understandable, comprehensible. I'm claiming that's a requirement in the modern world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And 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 so 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 if I have a choice between complicated and simple systems, I think it's ethically incumbent upon me to go simple and i don't know what you think yeah, right i well i agree we definitely need to have comprehensible and explainable systems so that we can actually do all the things you're talking about uh, maintain them uh all the things you were talking about uh, like related to maintenance specification uh and so forth so um i the, the, the simple fact that we're not doing that right now, I think I'm concerned. It implies to me that we're, we're really trying to do things harder than we than, than, than we're capable of understanding right now. And maybe we don't have as much choice in that. Or, or, or we haven't looked at simplicity. Like, have you seen, did, Mike, you've seen Mo Young's stuff before, where they, you know, they were doing testing of big data applications and they didn't have to do massive great testing to the cross product of all possible data values in their cloud. They said, our code has a small number of pathways, mm -hmm. you know, and I want to just offer that to you all as a, don't, don't listen to me, listen to Mo Young, listen to Prem. There's a whole bunch of people knocking on the door saying, you know, simplicity might be a thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a great insight. Okay, so uh, we are already out of time, uh, way over time. So uh, let uh, thanks to Tim again for the awesome talk, and thank you for the audience. Uh, for and and, and I, I think I think there's still space for meeting time on Monday if people want to. Right, well, wow. I've got some meetings with some of you I know, and uh, there might still be space for others if you want. Okay, so I'll I'll circulate that. So, yep, thank you all again and. Bye-bye. Have a nice weekend. Stay safe.